James Joseph Whitey Bulger, a name that strikes fear and fascination in the hearts of many, was a notorious Irish-American mobster who ruled the underbelly of South Boston for decades. His life and death serve as a testament to the intricate and dangerous world of organized crime. Born on September 3, 1929, in Dorchester, Massachusetts, Bulger grew up in a working-class family. He was the second of six children and raised in a predominantly Irish neighborhood known for its resilience and pride. From an early age, Bulger displayed a sharp intelligence and street-smart demeanor that would later become crucial in his ascent to power. Bulger's criminal career began in his teenage years when he joined a local street gang. This marked the beginning of a lifelong journey into the dark abyss of organized crime. However, it was his partnership with Stephen Flemmy, a fellow Irish-American mobster, that propelled him into the upper echelons of the criminal underworld. Bulger's grip on South Boston was unrelenting. And through a combination of fear and loyalty, he built an extensive criminal network that controlled the streets. Despite the violence and chaos that often accompanied his reign, he managed to maintain a certain level of order and protection. However, beneath his public facade of Robin Hood-like generosity were countless tales of destruction and brutality. Bulger was known to eliminate anyone who posed a threat to his empire, no matter how small or insignificant. His wrath extended not only to rival gang members, but also to innocent bystanders who stumbled upon his operations. The dark cloud that loomed over Bulger's criminal empire eventually caught up with him. In 1994, sensing imminent capture, he went on the run becoming one of America's most wanted fugitives. For 16 long years, Bulger remained elusive, ultimately finding refuge in Santa Monica, California. However, his luck ran out on June 22, 2011, when the FBI captured him and his long-term girlfriend, Catherine Gregg. His arrest sent shockwaves throughout the nation, as it not only marked the end of an era, but also exposed the deep-rooted corruption within law enforcement. Bulger had been an FBI informant for decades, providing crucial information about rival gangs while simultaneously running his criminal empire. The subsequent trial was a spectacle that captivated the country as the truth about Bulger's reign of terror finally emerged. The trial uncovered the extent of his crimes, revealing a web of corruption that implicated various law enforcement officials. The trial also shed light on the extent of the damage Bulger had caused to innocent lives driving home the sobering reality of his ruthlessness. Ultimately, justice caught up with Bulger as he was convicted and sentenced to two consecutive life terms plus five years. However, his time as a prisoner was short-lived. On October 30th, 2018, just a few short years into his sentence, he was found brutally murdered in his cell at the United States Penitentiary, Hazleton, in West Virginia. His death marked the end of a tumultuous saga, leaving behind a complex legacy that continues to intrigue and horrify to this day. The story of James Joseph Whitey Bulger is not merely that of a feared and cunning mobster, it is a tale that serves as a cautionary reminder of the dark underbelly that exists beneath the surface of society. Through his life and death, we are reminded of the allure and consequences of a life lived on the wrong side of the law. Ultimately, Bulger's story is a chilling reminder of the age-old adage that crime, in all its forms, never goes unpunished.
Welcome to another episode of Crimson Sin with Tamsin Lee. I am your host, Tamsin Lee. Full show notes and sources can be found at tamsinleecrimsonsin.podbean.com, and you can also find a link in the description. This episode is a little late, and I do apologize for that. I had a cold and did not feel that my voice was recording ready. So I try to keep all of my listeners in the loop with what is going on with the show. For instance, like this, like how my episode came out late because I couldn't record. So as a way to keep everyone in the know, I have created an account on Buy Me a Coffee where you can keep up with the latest from Crimson Sin with Tamsin Lee. You can find it at www.buymeacoffee.com slash Tamsin Lee. I will be posting a lot of things on there, including upcoming cases I will cover. Also, if you have a case you would like to request, you can leave it in the comments section there. I am still figuring out all the ins and outs on that site, so I may be a little slow. Not with posting things, because I figured that one out. (laughs) That was pretty self-explanatory. Just give me a few minutes to catch up with all the other things on there. You can also find the link to this website in the description. Today's case is about James Joseph Bulger Jr. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. So I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his last name. He is also known as Whitey Bulger. He began his criminal career when he was only 10 years old. First arrested when he was 14 years old, he was then sent to a juvenile reformatory, which did very little to help the career criminal. As soon as he was out, he would be jailed again and again, with each new release coming with new opportunities to grow his rap sheet. Even being placed on the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitive list, coming only second to Osama bin Laden and a $2 million reward for his capture. As with all stories, let's start from the beginning. His father, James Joseph Bulger Sr., was from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland. After settling in Everett, Massachusetts, James Sr. married a first-generation Irish immigrant named Jane Veronica, or Jean McCarthy. Their first child, James Joseph Bulger Jr. was born on September 3, 1929, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. He was one of six children born to the Catholic Irish American couple. Bulger Sr. worked as a union laborer and occasionally as a longshoreman. When he lost his arm during an industrial accident, the family was reduced to poverty. They would soon move into the Mary Ellen McCormick housing project in South Boston. During his school years, he was described as a troublemaker who was more interested in street life than his academics, a choice which paralleled with his siblings, one of which, William Bulger, would serve as a member of the Massachusetts Senate for 25 years and president of the University of Massachusetts for seven years. Early in his criminal career, Bulger was given the nickname Whitey by police due to his blonde hair, which I will be referring to him as Whitey from here on out. He hated the name, preferring to be called Jim, Jimmy, or Boots. The nickname Boots came about from wearing cowboy boots, which he used to conceal a switchblade. His liking for street life gave him a reputation as a street fighter and a thief, which led him down the path of meeting more experienced criminals and discovering more lucrative opportunities. By the time he was 14 years old, Whitey was a part of a street gang called the Shamrocks. At this age, in 1943, he would also be arrested for larceny, He would also be charged for other crimes, including assault, forgery, and armed robbery. Eventually being sentenced to a juvenile reformatory for five years for these offenses. After his release, Whitey joined the United States Air Force, earning his high school diploma and trained as a mechanic. 
However, old habits die hard as he would serve time in military jail for several assaults. In 1950, he was arrested again by Air Force police for going AWOL. Still, in 1952, he managed to receive an honorable discharge and returned to Massachusetts. Shortly after his return, Whitey's offenses grew increasingly large in scale, leading up to a string of bank robberies from Rhode Island to Indiana. In June 1956, he was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. While serving his first term at Atlanta Penitentiary, Whitey later claimed he was used as a human subject in the CIA-sponsored MKUltra program. He stated that the inmates were recruited by deception. Whitey and 18 other inmates volunteered for the program because they were told they were helping to find a cure for schizophrenia and they would receive reduced sentences. Whitey complained that they were actually being used for research regarding mind control, which has been verified as evidence of the experiments were later confirmed by CIA documentation that has emerged. Over an 18-month period, the inmates were all given LSD and other drugs. Whitey described his experience as nightmarish and said it took him to the depths of insanity. In his notebooks, he would write that he heard voices and feared being committed for life if he admitted this to anyone. For those of my listeners who are not familiar with MKUltra, I will give you a brief summary. It was a project researched by the CIA, which lasted up to 10 years, in which they sought ways to control the human mind. This project came about during the early period of the Cold War from around the late 1940s and early 1950s because the CIA were scared that communists had perfected some kind of a drug or a magical potion or some type of technique that would allow them to control human minds. Due to this fear... They wanted to have a truth serum that would make prisoners spill anything that they knew. They wanted something like an amnesiac that would make people forget what they had done. And of course, the most important goal of all was to have a drug that would allow the CIA to direct agents to carry out acts of like sabotage or assassinations and forget who had ordered them to do it. The added bonus, or the cherry on top, would be if the agent could forget that they had even carried out that action at all. It's a pretty terrifying concept if you think about it. Whitey was then transferred to maximum security at Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. It has been alleged that he was moved to Alcatraz from Atlanta because it was discovered that he was making escape plans. While at Alcatraz, Whitey kept in shape through weightlifting and he would take full advantage of the educational opportunities that were there for inmates. He completed typing, bookkeeping, and business law courses. He also read many books on poetry, politics, and military history. His stay in Alcatraz appeared to have been somewhat enjoyable of a time for him in his life, as he would later state, If I could choose my epitaph on my tombstone, it would be, I'd rather be in Alcatraz. Later in his sentence, Whitey would find himself transferred to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary before being moved to Louisburg Federal Penitentiary in 1963. After serving nine years in prison, his third petition for parole was granted in 1965. But still, he returned to his life of crime in Boston and a stint at romance. He fell in love with a waitress at a North Quincy cafe. The pair started living together in 1966. They had a son in 1967, but at the age of six, their son died from Ray syndrome after having a severe allergic reaction to an aspirin injection. 
The two would eventually split after being together for 12 years. So after his release from prison in 1965, at first, he worked as a janitor and a construction worker before becoming a bookmaker and loan shark for mobster Donald Killeen, whose gang, the Killeens, controlled South Boston for over 20 years. Whitey is said to have joined the Killeens at a time when rival factions were at war. This gang was led by three brothers, Donald, Kenny, and Eddie, along with two others named Billy O'Sullivan and Jack Curran. The mobster's base was the Transit Cafe in South Boston, which later became known as Whitey's Triple O's. The other gang on this turf was the Mullins, who were a loosely organized crew of thieves who stole from the ships that brought goods into Boston Harbor and from the warehouses where they were stored. The gang was described as particularly talented and opportunistic. They were likely to steal a truckload of Easter hams as they were to steal a truckload of televisions. They also had strength in numbers, with the Boston Police Department estimating that there were as many as 60 members. So the whole spat pretty much started during a fight when Kenny Colleen allegedly chewed off Michael Dwyer's nose, who was a member of the Mullen Gang in 1971. Mullen Gang members Polly McGonagall, Francis Leonard, Thomas King, and Dennis Roach I don't know if his last name is Roach or Roche. Since I'm from Louisiana, I want to say Roche, but... <laughs> so back to the story. The Mullen Gang members went to the Transit Cafe looking to confront the Killeens, who had already left the bar. Donald Killeen viewed their presence at their headquarters as a direct challenge. This resulted in a gang war, which led to a string of murders throughout Boston and the surrounding suburbs. It was during this time that Whitey committed his first murder. However, this was a botched assassination as he was supposed to kill Mullen member Paul McGonagall. Instead, he mistakenly murdered Paul's innocent, law-abiding twin brother Donald. Fellow mobster Kevin Weeks stated of the incident, Jimmy shot him right between the eyes. Only, it wasn't Polly, it was Donald. Jimmy drove straight to his mentor, Billy O'Sullivan's house, and told him, I shot the wrong one, I shot Donald. Billy said, don't worry about it, he wasn't healthy anyway, he smoked. He would have gotten lung cancer. According to some sources, during this time, Whitey supposedly switched sides, killing the Colleen leader. Former Mullen boss Patrick Nee claimed that Paul McGonagall ambushed and murdered O'Sullivan under the assumption that O'Sullivan murdered his brother. When Whitey realized he was on the losing side, he secretly approached Howie Winter, the leader of the Winter Hill Gang. This is where Whitey allegedly told him he could end the war by murdering the Colleen leadership. However, other sources dispute this claim, stating that Colleen was murdered by James Mantiville and Tommy King of the Mullen Gang. So on May 13th, 1972, Donald Killeen walked outside his home to grab a toy fire truck, which was a birthday present for his son's fourth birthday from his car. He was gunned down, a machine gun pointed at his face, when 15 rounds were unloaded. After Donald's death, Whitey and the Colleens fled Boston, fearing they would be targeted next. Mullen boss Patrick Nee then arranged for this dispute to be mediated by Howie Winter and Joseph Russo. Capo Regime, which is a leadership position in the Mafia, they were Capo Regime of the Patriarcha crime family from Rhode Island. The three gangs sat down at Chandler's nightclub in Boston's South End where Nee and King represented the Mullins and Whitey represented the Colleens. The Mullins and Colleens would join forces under Winter, who was the overall boss. 
Not long after this alliance, the only remaining Colleen brother, Kenny, was out jogging when Whitey called him over to a car, which was also occupied by Winter Hill members, Stephen Flemmie and John Martorano, and stated, It's over. You're out of business. No more warnings. A message for him to not take over his brother's rackets or avenge their deaths. By the end of 1972, Whitey and his new allies in the Mullen Gang were basically the CEOs among gangsters in Boston. This truce between the rival gangs formed the Winter Hill Gang, which was named after the Winter Hill neighborhood of Somerville, Massachusetts, not Howie Winter. Whitey quickly rose the ranks and cemented his reputation for violence by using murder as a means of discipline for defiant Mullen gang members, even being implicated in the deaths of at least three of his associates, including Spike O'Toole, Polly McGonagall, and Tommy King. It was also reported that in late August or early September of 1974, Whitey Bulger and an accomplice set fire to an elementary school to intimidate U.S. District Court Judge Wendell Arthur Garrity Jr. over his mandated plan to desegregate schools in the city of Boston. Then, on September 8, 1975, Whitey and another accomplice tossed a Molotov cocktail into the John F. Kennedy birthplace in retaliation for Senator Ted Kennedy's support for Boston school desegregation. By 1979, Whitey had become a prominent figure in Boston's organized crime scene. That very year, Howie Winter, the boss of the Winter Hill Gang, was sent to prison for fixing horse races leaving Whitey Bulger and Stephen Flemmy as the gang's leadership during his absence. Over the next 16 years, he would control a very large portion of Boston's drug dealing, bookmaking, and loan sharking operations. But also during the same time period, from 1975 to 1990, Whitey was an informant for the FBI. Even his closest associates had no idea that he was an informant. But Stephen Fleming was already a longtime FBI informant. Whitey Bulger took full advantage of his brother William's stature in the Massachusetts State Senate, as well as his childhood friendships who were linked to the police force in order to bring down a New England organized crime family, the Patriarchas while also building a more powerful and violent crime network of his own. In 1975, Whitey met with a Boston FBI agent and agreed to provide information about Winter Hill's primary rival in crime, the Boston La Cosa Nostra, or LCN, this arrangement was very beneficial for the FBI because Whitey and Steve provided information that helped the FBI dismantle two leadership tiers of the Boston LCN. While working as an informant, Whitey told his FBI handler that a member of the Boston LCN named Sonny Mercurio was ripe for the picking to become an informant. When Mercurio became an informant, it provided the FBI with the opportunity to bug an LCN new member induction ceremony. However, the story as to how Whitey became an informant is up for debate. What is known of his association with the FBI is that in 1971, the FBI approached Whitey in an attempt to recruit him as an informant in their effort against the Patriarcha crime family. Special Agent John Connolly was assigned to make the pitch to Whitey, but failed to gain his trust. Three years after this, Whitey partnered with Steve Flemmy, who had actually been an FBI informant since 1965. Connolly was known to boast to his colleagues that he had successfully recruited Whitey at a late night meeting claiming that the FBI could help him in his feud with Patriarcha underboss Gennaro Angiolo. However, Kevin Weeks believed it more likely that 
Steve Flemmy betrayed Whitey to the FBI with the choice to either supply them with information or return to prison. In a 2011 interview, Steve Flemmy stated, Me and Whitey gave the feds shit and they gave us gold. But apparently, Whitey made friends with Connolly. According to Kevin Weeks, Connolly told him that 90% of the information in the informant files came from Steve. But he had to put Whitey's name on the files to keep his file active. As long as Whitey was an active informant, then Connolly could justify meeting with Whitey to give him valuable information. Even after Connolly retired, he still had friends in the FBI and would keep Whitey in the loop of what was going on. In December 1977, Agent John Morris took control of the organized crime squad at the FBI's Boston field office. It was reported that Morris not only proved that he was unable to stifle Connolly's protection of Whitey, but even started assisting him. Morris had been thoroughly compromised as an agent. Morris was transferred to the Boston's FBI Anti-Drug Task Force in 1983, but still remained an accomplice to Connolly and Whitey. Now that we made it to the informant and FBI side of the story, we need to backtrack to February 1979 when prosecutors indicted numerous members of the Winter Hill Gang when Howie Winter was sent to prison for fixing horse races. Whitey and Steve Flemmy were actually supposed to be a part of this indictment, but Agent Connolly and Agent Morris persuaded prosecutor Jeremiah T. O'Sullivan to drop the charges against them, instead naming the pair as unindicted co-conspirators. Whitey Bulger continued to operate the Boston Rackets with immunity in the early 1980s, while also accumulating more experience with murder. He even killed an innocent man during this time who just happened to be giving one of Whitey's targets a lift home. So all throughout the 1980s, Whitey, Flemmy, and Weeks operated rackets, including truck hijackings, bookmaking, loan sharking, arms trafficking, and extortion throughout eastern Massachusetts. All attempts to build a case against the three by the state and federal agencies were impeded, which was due to many factors. But the most prominent reason was the three of them had a fear of wiretaps and so would never discuss their business over the phone or in vehicles. Whitey was connected to the ice pick stabbing of Louis Latif in April 1980. Latif was a bookmaker and cocaine dealer at the time. It is widely believed in the organized crime world that Bulger carried out the murder himself. Latif was stabbed with an ice pick and then shot in the mouth. His body was then stuffed into a trash bag and placed in the trunk of his car. It is speculated that this killing was in retaliation for Latif's refusal to pay Whitey a cut from his cocaine dealing profits and for allegedly committing two murders without Whitey's permission. It was later reported that a witness came forward to inform the FBI that he had seen Whitey and Flemmy murder Latif. This witness offered the information to the FBI as a means to enter the witness protection program. As he was a cone dealer himself, the witness's name was Edward Brian Halloran, also known as Balloonhead. He also held information that linked Whitey and Flemmy to the murder of Roger Wheeler. Agent Connolly and John Morris then leaked this information of Halloran's dealings with the FBI to Whitey. Bulger and Flemmy were informed of Halloran's meeting with the FBI out of town and when he was back in South Boston in May 1982. Kevin Weeks was ordered by Whitey to find Halloran and keep watch on him while he and another associate armed themselves. Weeks learned that Halloran was having dinner at a restaurant located in South Boston. Whitey and his accomplice waited in a car in the parking lot. 
Whitey and his accomplice were allegedly in disguise as Pulcher was armed with a rifle and his accomplice carried a machine pistol. It was also reported that Whitey was carrying a walkie-talkie so he could communicate with Weeks, who was watching Halloran's movements. Halloran just so happened to accidentally bump into a friend of his named Michael Donahue. When Halloran explained to his friend that he did not drive to the restaurant, Michael, who was a truck driver and had no known connections to the Winter Hill gang or criminal activities, offered to drive him home. The pair left the restaurant as Weeks informed Whitey over walkie-talkie that Halloran was on the move. Once they were in Michael's vehicle, Bulger and his accomplice opened fire. Michael was hit in the head, dying instantly. Halloran was badly wounded, but survived long enough to inform authorities that the person who shot at them was named James Flynn. However, he did not identify Bulger as the other killer. During the mid-1980s, Whitey started summoning drug dealers from in and around Boston, and he would tell them that He had been offered a substantial amount of money in return for for the dealer's execution. In return, he would then demand a large cash payment as price for not killing them. However, the allure of profits which could be made from this line of business became too irresistible for Whitey. Most of South Boston's cocaine and marijuana trafficking was under the control of a mobster named John Shea. Whitey allegedly considered killing Shay, but instead decided to extort a weekly cut of the profits. He would also enforce strict rules over the dealers who operated in his territory by forbidding the use of PCP and selling drugs to children. Those who did not abide by these rules would be violently driven out of his turf. Around this time, Whitey Bulger was also supplying weapons to the Irish Republican Army, which was fighting the British government in Northern Ireland. Tensions between the Winter Hill Gang and the Patriarcha family increased drastically during the summer of 1983, when an employee at a cash laundering vending machine company that the Patriarchas owned called Coinomatic was kidnapped while working. From a tip, the Boston Police Department then raided a butcher shop located in South Boston, which was co-owned by Whitey and two other Winter Hill gang members. Officers discovered the missing employee hanging from a beef rack. The employee had been held for more than six days and was subject to grave torture. Law enforcement hoped that the victim would fully cooperate with them and eventually go into witness protection. However, he refused to testify and all documents had his full name redacted. The following months saw three low-level Winter Hill gang members executed, believed to be in response to the employee's kidnapping. This then started an internal investigation within the FBI, looking solely at Agent Morris. In 1988, journalist Gerard O'Neill published a story about Whitey Bulger's status as an FBI informant, completely detailing Whitey's work with the FBI while also actively committing crimes. There had been rumors of Whitey being a narc long before this story was published because it was highly suspicious, highly unusual that he had gone on in this position for years without an arrest. In the early 1990s, Whitey Bulger and Steve Flemmy agreed to peacefully split control of organized crime activities in and around Boston with the new head of the New England LCN, Frank Salim, Winter Hill and the LCN then controlled the entire Boston area until December 1994. During the summer of 1991, Whitey miraculously had the winning Massachusetts lottery ticket, which was bought at a store he owned. 
He, along with three other men, shared the winnings of $14 million. It is widely believed that Whitey won the money illegitimately. Outside of the FBI, law enforcement was convinced that Whitey was a top criminal who was responsible for some of the most vicious murders in Boston. The Drug Enforcement Administration, the Massachusetts State Police, and the Boston Police Department started an investigation in 1994, believing the FBI to be compromised, and as such, kept the Bureau out of the loop until arrests were made. Whitey Bulger's downfall began in April 1994 when a joint task force of the DEA, the Boston Police, and the Massachusetts State Police started looking into Whitey's illegal gambling operations. The FBI was not informed of this investigation. After numerous bookmakers agreed to testify as having paid protection money to Whitey, a federal case was then built against him under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, also called RICO. But Whitey had set up safe deposit boxes across North America and Europe, which contained cash, jewelry, and passports. In places such as Oklahoma, Florida, London, Birmingham, Dublin, and Venice. Which would be something very valuable to him if he were to need to disappear, right? Which is exactly what happened. In December 1994, Agent Connolly informed Whitey that sealed indictments had come from the Department of Justice and the FBI was to begin making arrests during Christmas. On December 23, 1994, Whitey fled Boston with his girlfriend, Teresa Stanley. They spent Christmas in Selden, New York. Whitey and Stanley then spent New Year's Day in a hotel in New Orleans' French Quarter. Believing that the information that Connolly gave him was a false alarm, he prepared to return to Boston on January 5th, 1995. However, that night, Flemmy was arrested by the DEA outside a restaurant. Police detective Michael Flemmy, Steve's brother, then informed Kevin Weeks of Steve's arrest, who in turn immediately told Whitey. So instead of returning to Boston, Whitey and his girlfriend would spend the next three weeks traveling to New York City, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. But Stanley decided that she wanted to return to her children in Boston. Whitey Bulger then traveled to Clearwater, Florida with Stanley to pick up his false identification as Tom Baxter from a safety deposit box. He drove his girlfriend to Boston and dropped her off in a parking lot. The sealed indictments were for Whitey, Flemmy, and two others for racketeering charges in 1995. The other two who were indicted just so happened to listen to a tape where they overheard two of the agents mention they should have told one of their informants to give a list of questions to other wise guys. The lawyer of the two men named Tony Cardinal learned of this and realized that the FBI had lied to protect an informant. This led the lawyer to believe this wasn't the first time this had happened and sought to force prosecutors to reveal the identities of any informants used in connection with the case. Federal Judge Mark L. Wolf granted this motion on May 22, 1997. On June 3rd, the head of the Organized Crime and Racketeering section of the Department of Justice, Paul E. Coffey, admitted that Whitey Bulger was an FBI informant, but because he was accused of leading a criminal enterprise while working as an informant, and now he was considered a fugitive, Bulger had forfeited any reasonable expectation that his identity would be protected. On September 5, 2006, federal judge Reginald C. Lindsay ruled that the mishandling of Bulger and Flemmy caused the 1984 murder of informant John McIntyre 
awarding his family $3.1 million in damages. I know I kind of went off track and into the future, but worth noting all of that in one fail swoop. So now we're going to go back to 1995. <laughs> so Whitey then met with Kevin Weeks at Malibu Beach in Dorchester, where Weeks brought Bulger's girlfriend, Catherine Gregg. Bulger and Gregg then went on the run together. In mid-November 1995, Kevin Weeks and Bulger met for the very last time at the Lion Statues in front of the New York Public Library main branch. Weeks stated that at this time, he knew there was something else going on with Whitey, but he did not fully understand everything until six months later. But in that moment, it appeared as though Whitey had already came to terms with the fact that he would never return to South Boston. A federal grand jury in Boston returned a 29-count indictment against Whitey Bulger and four other leaders of the Winter Hill Gang and the Patriarca family on July 7th, 1996, with Bulger receiving 13 counts of racketeering. Kevin Weeks was then arrested on November 17th, 1999 by a combined force of the DEA and the Massachusetts State Police. He would ultimately receive a deal with federal prosecutors by revealing where almost every penny was stashed and where every body was buried. Connolly was also indicted in December 1999 for feeding confidential information to Whitey and Flemmy, lying in FBI reports, and for also taking bribes. He would also face racketeering charges. He was convicted in 2002, receiving a 10-year sentence. He was also convicted of a second-degree murder charge in 2008, for one of Whitey's victims in Florida that occurred 26 years prior, and he received 40 years for that conviction. Even with Whitey on the run, he was still culminating indictments. Whitey Bulger, along with Stephen and Michael Flemmy, would be charged in a 48-count federal indictment containing racketeering, murder, and other crimes on May 23, 2001. While running from the law, Whitey's time as a fugitive had him frequently moving. He reportedly stayed in places such as Southern California, Vancouver, British Columbia, and London. One of the first confirmed sightings of Whitey was in London in 2002, watching the movie Hannibal. But even with this confirmed sighting, authorities were still sent on a wild goose chase, with many unconfirmed sightings all over the world. FBI agents would be sent to Uruguay, Normandy, and Italy. The FBI then decided to turn their attention to Victoria, British Columbia, in 2010, visiting bookstores in the area because they knew Whitey enjoyed reading books. They would question employees and distribute wanted posters in hopes they would come close to capturing Bulger. Whitey Bulger had a reward of $2 million for information leading to his arrest. He was only second to Osama bin Laden's capture reward. He had been featured on the television show America's Most Wanted 16 times from 1995 until October 2nd, 2010. Authorities received a tip from Anna B., I am not going to even try to pronounce her last name because she is from Iceland and, you know, it is impossible to try to pronounce a Icelandic person's name without actually hearing it, only seeing it written down. It's kind of hard to pronounce it. <laughs> she was a former model, actress, and Miss Iceland 1974. She was living in an apartment near Santa Monica Beach in Whitey Bulger's neighborhood. The day after receiving this tip, task force members lured Whitey out of his apartment and reportedly arrested him without incident. They then proceeded into the house and arrested his girlfriend, Greg. 
So in order to lure Whitey out of his apartment, the FBI had the building manager coax Whitey to the garage of the apartment by telling him that the lock on his storage locker was broken. When he went to the garage, he was surrounded by FBI agents and local police officers. Initially, Whitey insisted he was Charlie Gasco, one of his fake identities. Eventually, he would admit, you know who I am, I'm Whitey Bulger. Whitey was charged with murder, conspiracy to commit murder, extortion, narcotics distribution, and money laundering. Searching his apartment, authorities found more than $822,000 in cash, 30 firearms, and numerous fake IDs. Most of these items would be found in the walls. After 16 years at large, Bulger was arrested in Santa Monica, California on June 22, 2011 at 81 years old. Authorities believe that the arrests of Whitey and his girlfriend was a direct result of the media campaign the FBI launched in 14 television markets across the U.S. where Whitey and Greg allegedly had ties. This campaign focused more on Greg and described her as an animal lover who would frequently go to beauty salons. U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts, Carmen Ortiz, stated that she did not believe the death penalty was an option for Bulger for the charges he faced in her district. However, it was possible that he would face the death penalty for two cases outside her district. One of the cases Ortiz was referring to happened in Oklahoma in 1981 when Whitey reportedly ordered the killing of Roger Wheeler Sr., Whitey Bulger started talking to authorities immediately after being brought back to Boston, even claiming that during his days as a fugitive, he would often travel back and forth across the Mexico border so he could buy medicine for his heart disease. But apparently during his days on the run, he wasn't exactly hiding out either. As many witnesses and tipsters brought their sightings to the FBI's attention, He even admitted that while traveling, many people did spot him. With Bulger talking to authorities, it is speculated that many anticipated and feared that he would tell authorities secrets regarding corruption at the local, state, and federal levels in exchange for favorable treatment during sentencing. It is widely believed that the corruption of these officials was the only reason he was able to operate his criminal enterprise for so long. Which I think we've pretty much already established that's what it was. Kevin Weeks was surprised by his friend's decision to cooperate with authorities, stating that Whitey wasn't the person he remembered and therefore no one was worried about him. On July 6, 2011, Whitey pled not guilty to 48 charges, including 19 counts of murder, extortion, money laundering, obstruction of justice, perjury, narcotics distribution, and weapons violations. Catherine Gregg, Whitey's girlfriend, had been wanted by the FBI since 1999 for harboring a fugitive. After being captured with Bulger, she sought for release on bail and home confinement, which was ultimately denied. Her decisions in being tried are slightly baffling to me. So, Greg initially stated that she would go to trial rather than accept a plea bargain. But in March 2012, she pled guilty to conspiracy to harbor a fugitive identity fraud and conspiracy to commit identity fraud. For these charges, she was sentenced to eight years in federal prison on June 12, 2012, and declined to speak during her sentencing. However, she gained another indictment in September 2015 on criminal contempt because she refused to testify before a grand jury about whether or not other people aided Whitey Bulger while he was on the run. She pled guilty to this charge in February 2016. Her attorney requested 12 months in prison for this charge, while prosecutors asked for 37 months to be tacked onto her sentence. 
In April 2016, she was ultimately given an additional 21 months to her eight-year sentence for the criminal contempt charge. She completed her sentence on July 23, 2020, living quietly in South Boston with her twin sister, Margaret McCusker. While things seemed to work out relatively well for Catherine Gregg, Whitey Bulger's story is completely different. On June 12, 2013, Bulger went to trial on 32 counts of racketeering and firearms possession. With the racketeering counts, including allegations that Bulger was involved in 19 murders, the trial lasted two months and included the testimony of 72 witnesses. The jury started their deliberations on August 6th. On August 12th, the jury convicted Whitey Bulger of 31 out of 32 counts in the indictment and convicted Bulger on the murders of 11 victims. Paul McGonigal, Edward Connors, Thomas King, Richard Castucci, Roger Wheeler, Brian Halloran, Michael Donahue, John Callahan, Arthur Bucky Barrett, John McIntyre, and Deborah Husey. On November 14, 2013, Bulger was sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment plus five years. The judge told Bulger that such a sentence was necessary given his unfathomable crimes, some of which inflicted agonizing suffering on his victims. Whitey was also ordered to forfeit $25.2 million and pay $19.5 million in restitution. After sentencing, prosecutors in Florida and Oklahoma announced they would wait until after sentencing concluded before deciding whether or not to prosecute Bulger in their states. He could have received the death penalty from these two states. However, he was already in his 80s, so how much time did he have left to serve, right? It was reported that Whitey only made one friend named Clement Janis during his post-sentencing detention at the United States Penitentiary in Tucson. According to Janis, Whitey was attacked by another convict named Retro, whose knife pierced Whitey's neck and skull. The injury sent him to the prison infirmary for a month. It is still unknown whether Bulger was intentionally or randomly targeted. Allegedly, Retro was not motivated by any personal reasonings or problems against Whitey, but instead he committed this act so he could be sent to solitary confinement. Also, while in the Tucson facility, Whitey was allowed to start taking counseling with a prison psychologist. But it was alleged that rumors were making their way around the prison that the psychologist was too friendly toward Whitey and may have even allowed him to use her phone. Because of these rumors, his counseling ended. He was then transferred to the Coleman Federal Correctional Complex in Florida during September 2014. After being transferred, it was reported that Whitey began experiencing night terrors. He claimed that these had to have been from the experiments he had taken part in while imprisoned in the 1950s, where he was given drugs. His health seemed to deteriorate also, as he was now confined to a wheelchair. In October 2018, Whitey was transferred to the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City. Before arriving to the United States Penitentiary Hazleton in West Virginia on October 29th. On October 30th at 8.20 a.m., 89-year-old Whitey Bulger was found dead. He was in his wheelchair and had been beaten to death by multiple inmates armed with a padlock wrapped inside a sock and shivs. Law enforcement stated that Bulger was unrecognizable as his eyes had been nearly gouged out and his tongue almost cut off. 
The homicide was the third in the prison within 40 days. And correctional officers even warned Congress before Whitey's murder that the facility was dangerously understaffed. The number one suspect in Bulger's murder was 51-year-old Massachusetts-based mafia hitman Freddie Geese, who reportedly hated rats. Freddie and his brother were both serving life in prison for several violent crimes. Another suspect in Bulger's death was Paul J. DeCollegero, another Boston mobster who was serving a 25-year sentence for racketeering and conspiracy that led to the 1996 murder and dismemberment of 19-year-old Aylin Silva. Whitey Bulger's funeral mass was held on November 8, 2018 at St. Monica St. Augustine Church in South Boston. His family members and Catherine Gregg's twin sister attended the funeral. While his death was a sad end for his family and those who knew him, it came as a relief to many who lived in Boston, most notably for the family members of his victims. One of these family members even stated, he died the way I hoped he always was going to die. In September 2019, Whitey Bulger's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Justice Department and sought $200,000 in damages. The family alleged that by lowering Bulger's medical status and transferring him to Hazleton, he was deliberately placed in harm's way. They continued to claim that there was simply no other explanation for the transfer of someone in his condition and inmate status to be placed in the general population of one of the country's most violent federal penitentiaries. In January 2022, U.S. District Judge dismissed the lawsuit, ruling that federal law did not allow Whitey's family the right to sue Bureau of Prisons officials because Congress expressly puts custody of inmates in the hands of the BOP. Three men were indicted in connection with the death of Bulger on August 18th, 2022. The three men are Freddie Geese, Paul J. DeColinero, and Sean McKinnon. Geese and DeColinero are charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, aiding and abetting first-degree murder, and assault, resulting in serious bodily injury. McKinnon is charged separately with making false statements to a federal agent. Freddie Geese's trial for this incident is scheduled to begin in December 2024. So what did you think of today's case? What shocked you most about Whitey Bulger's tale? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Also, don't forget to like, follow, or subscribe to stay up to date with the latest cases from me, Tams and Lee. Also, don't forget to always check Buy Me a Coffee slash Tams and Lee for the latest updates on everything happening with the show. Thank you for listening and for your support. Stay safe, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye!